Lord this morning. Come on, let's stand to our feet and prepare our hearts for worship. Father God, we're so grateful to be in your house this morning. It's an honor and a privilege to serve you, Lord. We just pray that you will be glorified and lifted high. In the mighty, precious name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's prepare. Jesus has given me 
if you don't need to pocket it all, put your hands together this morning as we worship our King of Kings and our Lord of Kings. Hallelujah, Jesus. How do people know that he is a firm foundation, that he is a rock that we can stand on? And as long as our feet are planted on that rock, we are safe. So come on this morning, let's lift our hands and sing about this firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock upon which I am, when everything around me is shaken, and I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me down, he's faithful So I would leave him now. He won't. Come on, can anybody testify to that this morning? Come on. He won't. And I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not happy. Oh, I'll say 
Hallelujah, Jesus, we love you this morning. And we're so grateful for your work on the cross, Lord. Grateful for your love that you sold to your children, Lord God. And we just want to worship you this morning and honor your name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on. We worship you, Jesus. <laughs> God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. As you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath, the planet fall. If the stars were made to worship, so light, I can see your heart in heaven. Every burning star, a signal fire of praise. If creation sing your praises so blind. So loud. In God of your pride. Don't speak in vain, no syllable empty your voice. For once you have spoken, all nature inside can follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath Evolving in pursuit of what you say If it all reveals your nature so blind I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you so light, so light, so light. Stars were made to worship. 
ships of life. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar, your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will Send it so loud. If the rocks cry out in silence, so alive. If the summer fall our praise, it still falls shy. Then we'll sing again a hundred billion. Chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you create the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear When you lost your life so I could find it here If you left the grave behind you so alive I can see your heart in everything you've done Every part designed in a work of art called love. If you gladly chose to render so blind, oh, come on, I can see your heart a billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to save. You gave your life to love them so much Like you would again a hundred billion times But what magic could amount to your design You're the one who never leaves the one Put your hands together this morning for that God that we serve. Hallelujah, Jesus. Gracious Father, we, we just praise you this morning that each and every one of us are one of those precious souls that you sent your son to die for and to save God. God, we thank you for never leaving us behind. No matter what we do or, or what we say, God, we know you love us and you offer us your grace when we turn to you and ask for your forgiveness, God. God, we invite you into this room today. God, we ask for you to be a part of this message, of this service, this worship. We just ask for you to be in every moment of today, God. We ask for you to fill this room with your Holy Spirit. We want to feel you move throughout this room today, God. We want to feel your presence in each of our lives, God. And God, anything that we brought into this room with us today that's keeping us from hearing what it is that you have for us, I pray that you break that wall down, break down that barrier, open up that door so that we can hear the message you have for us. Because God, we know that you have a plan in this day for each and every one of us. And it's a different plan. Each of us get a different plan, God, because you love us each individually. So God, we pray for those barriers to be broken down. We pray that we hear the message you have for us today, God. We pray that you move in our hearts and in our bodies today, God. And we pray that we hear this message and we take it out with us through the rest of our weeks, that we allow it to guide our steps in our weeks, that we allow it to guide our interactions, God. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. That's why we're here today. So join us. It's in the precious and most holy name of your son, Jesus, we pray. And all God's children say, amen. Amen. amen.
Well, welcome to church, everyone. We're so excited to have you here. Before you take a seat, turn and say good morning and welcome to worship. Welcome, everyone. We're so excited to have you here worshiping with us today. My name is Michelle York. I'm a part of the staff team here at Christ the King. And on behalf of everyone, we welcome you. And we're so thankful that you followed God's call on your heart to join us today for this message and this time of worship. Whether you're here live in this room or joining us from the other side of the screen somewhere around the world, we welcome you. And we're just so happy to have you here. If you haven't taken the opportunity to do this yet, we do invite you to fill out one of those Connect cards. It's a great way for us to meet you, know how we can be praying and caring for you, and most importantly, know how we can get you connected into the body here at Christ the King. So you can scan that huge QR code behind me or click the link on your screen if you're online, or you can even stop by the info table out in the gathering space for a paper form if you'd like to do it that way. But a few things coming up we want to make sure you're aware of. We're going to have a, our next mission trip to Burundi coming up in November. If you are in interested in a mission trip to Burundi, we invite you to join us on April 21st after each service right here in meeting room two, right, out, right outside the auditorium. It's a time to learn what that mission trip's all about. You're not committing to anything. You're literally just gathering some information. So we'd love for you to join us for that and learn more about, more about that trip. And then coming up on April 27th, we have our Spring Fest. Um, this is going to be an amazing day of just fun and activities for the community. It's open to the entire community. We'd love for you to join us. There's a DJ, bounce houses, crafts, activities, all sorts of fun things happening that day. We'd love for you to be a part of it. And if you'd like to volunteer to be a part of it and help us on that day, when you go to the website, you can actually sign up to be a volunteer as well. And then starting this week on April 10th, we have what's called Prayer Hour. It is starting every Wednesday right here in this room. Um, if you would like to come for prayer and be prayed over or to pray for yourself, you can come in every Wednesday, 1230 to 130, right here in this room. We'd love for you to join us. Now, as always, we just thank you for the ways you continue to give and serve the communities here at Christ the King. It's, it's with your giving financially, your giving of your times and your talents that we're able to live out that mission that we have right there on the wall and connect all people to that life-giving message of Jesus. So if you would like to give financially, you can do that through text to give. You can give online, give through your mobile app, give in person, however works best for you. And if you're interested in giving of your time and your talents to the communities here at Christ the King, make sure you fill out that Connect card and let us know how we can get you connected in because your hands and feet being the hands and feet of Jesus are super important so we would love to have you join us in that way but let's lift up our offerings today to God gracious father we lift these up to you today God we lift up every penny and every minute that is spent for you God it is to your glory and to your glory alone that these are given it's in the precious and most holy name of your son Jesus we pray amen well, we are starting our new series today, Under the Hood. We have a special guest speaker, Stephen Bolger, going to be bringing us the first message in our new series. So sit back, relax, and let's worship. Well, good morning. It's always cool to be the first one up on a series because you don't exactly know what the rolling's going to be, and then it just ends. But um, good morning. As Michelle said, my name is Stephen Bollinger. I'm one of the guest speakers here this morning. I'm on the communications team here at CTK. Um, and on behalf of the church, we just welcome you here this morning. If you joined us last week for Easter, we're so glad you're back in the house of the Lord. Um, it's a pleasure to worship together, but also to fellowship together and to dig into the Word um, and just see what God's really doing um, in this place and in our city and our nation. Um, but as, as the Roland mentioned, we're starting a new series called Under the Hood. Uh, this will be a study of 1 Corinthians uh, for the next eight weeks. So what I want to do for us today, if we can, is just lay the groundwork for everyone that is coming after. Um, so we're going to dig into a little bit of the history of the church in Corinth, 
the, the city and then um, what this letter from Paul really means as it relates to the church. Because oftentimes we have people that we engage in in our daily lives in society or maybe people look at the church as they drive by and we have these um, you know, preconceived ideas of what the church is. Is it perfect? Is it imperfect? Is it, hi- uh, um, not hypothetical, um, the other word. It's not coming to me right now. Anyway, um, but it essentially is, what is the church? How does it work? How does it function? What does it mean to be a body of believers that all have a common thing, which is that we're saved by the grace of God? So that's what I want to look into today. Um, if you have your notes, you can follow along. Some of the scriptures will be on the screen. Uh, but as we get going, I uh, just want to dig into that and, and, and discuss that in the way that it relates to all the nuances that we oftentimes find, um, for me, in cars. Right? So it's called Under the Hood. Uh, does anybody have a car? Anybody ever ridden in a car? Cool. That's a few of us. Um, horse? Okay. <laughs> Um, so we're going to talk about sort of the intricacies of, of the church, how the different believers interact. To me, it's, it's really cool um, when you think of, 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 of a car or a bus or any mode of transportation that's powered by an internal combustion engine, you've got so many different components that all come together to accomplish one thing, and that's to move. And the same thing can go for the church, that, that we're built up with so many different people, and the church is called to be the hands and feet of Christ. You might hear me referring it as to the body of Christ, that we are Christ's um, ambassadors to the world, that, that we're going to show his love to the world, the people outside these doors and also the people within. Um, but as anybody that owns a car, have you ever popped the hood of your car? Have you ever like, looked at it and been like, I have no idea what I'm looking at? Yeah. Like, there's the washer fluid, there's the battery. Everything in between is a mystery. Well, hopefully during this series, we can look at some parts of the church and try to make the function and the realities of the church less of a mystery. And we're going to do that honestly through real conversation and real um, just diving into what makes the church tick. Uh, for better, for worse, the things that, that makes the church struggle, that causes division, uh, the things that we struggle with, but also the, the beauty of what Christ has equipped the church with, the different spiritual gifts, the way that grace and peace interact in times of conflict, and the way that our unification around Christ overcomes any barriers that we may have with each other. See, that's the, the cool thing about the church being a living, breathing thing. So I want to dig into a little bit of uh, what it means and, and what it was like to be uh, the church in Corinth at the time when Paul was writing this letter to 1 Corinthians. And you look at the, the, ba- the book of 1 Corinthians, if you, if you ever have, and it's definitely a, a letter of pastoral correction. It's a letter that starts off saying, hey, I came to Corinth, Paul came to Corinth and helped start the church, but then he has been gone for some time And I wouldn't go as far as to say he is rebuking the church, but he's making sure that the church understands that there's some things that they need to get back on track with, right? And so you'll see it's a a letter written strongly. It's a letter that's written firmly, but it's also a letter written with grace and love. Um, Do we have any parents in the audience? Awesome. Uh, I, I've been a, a parent for, I guess, almost three years now. It's been uh, an amazing blessing and journey. Um, and I was trying to think of what this biblical correction and discipline might look like in our lives. And God gave me a, an idea yesterday. Um, we've been trying to potty train our son this week. And of course, by we, I mean my wife. Um, I've, I've been at work, and I got to help out a little bit yesterday, though. And I was, I was, we, were, we were working with, uh, his, my son's name's Liam, in the morning, and, and we were going potty and staying dry and all this good stuff, and we were in his room playing in this, like, makeshift ball pit, and I'm just keeping an eye on him, you know, hey, buddy, you doing good? You dry? Yes, yes. Do you need to go poo? No. Are you sure? Yes. Are you pooing? Yes. <laughs> And in that time, I could just feel there's, there's the, the frustration of like, are you kidding me? Like, y- okay, you told me honestly that you didn't need to go, but it's because you are going not where you should go. But there was a lack, a little bit of understanding when we're teaching new things on what is the correct thing. 
and why we do it. So as spiritual, as people new in their faith, if you just came for Easter and you just accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we would call you a new believer in Christ. Essentially, you have a testimony that your life is now changed. It's forever different because you ask God into your life, and that is your story. But that's where your story just begins. So at this point, uh, Paul talks about in the scriptures uh, of taking on spiritual milk versus spiritual food. That, that in your, your early walk with Christ, we need to be surrounded with believers that have been walking that walk for a while. We need to be surrounded by people that will speak into our lives pastorally, just as Paul is speaking into this young church. Okay? Okay? So a little bit back to the history of Corinth. So Corinth was a, a melting pot of people um, when, when Paul arrived. A little history, um, as, as many biblical cities go, this city had been conquered and then reconquered and then reconquered many, many times over the years. Going back to, to 431 AD with, or sorry, BC, sorry, 431 BC with the Peloponnesian War. Then you had the Corinthian War in 387 BC. And then the city was held by the Macedonians from three, uh, 338 to 243 B.C. So you see this period of like every 50 to 100 years that the city's just conquered and leveled and conquered and leveled. And there's new people coming to control it. And you might think, well, that's sort of weird. But the, the, the ge geographical situation of Corinth on the, on the nodal point of these four harbors made it a very desirable area to be. So the city was constantly sought after by, by ruling peoples and, and, and nations. And, and eventually it stabilized out in 243 B.C. And um, it made the mistake, Greece did, of attacking Rome in 146 A.D. And anybody know the Roman Empire, like a little history of it? They don't like to lose. <laughs> yeah, so in 146 B.C., um, Rome's general Mummus got the uh, go-ahead to completely sack Corinth. So they literally went in and leveled the city. They killed the entire male population. They took all of the female and kids as hostages, and the city lay desolate for almost 100 years. So that brings us into 44 B.C., this is still before Christ had come, before Paul had gone to missionary service. We're just laying a little bit of groundwork here so you understand. But leading up to that time, that had all the Greek influence of the Greek gods, the um, ideals, the astrology, all these different idols and temples that had been built. And when Rome went in and destroyed the city, they didn't tear down all of the archaeological things or the buildings. They just literally ran everyone out. So the city was no longer useful. So in 44 BC, uh, Julius Caesar gave the order to recolonize Corinth. So they recolonized Corinth starting in 44 BC with um, retired Roman soldiers. Um, a lot of the Jews from the Jewish diaspora, when they were pushed out of Italy, settled there and there was a synagogue in Corinth. But a lot of those ancient temples and stuff started being reactivated. So as Corinth was rebuilt into the bustling metropolis and the, the center economically for trade and for commerce, all of these outside influences came back into play. And they came back into play so much so that before Corinth was destroyed, it was known as the sin city of the day, right? So you take the commerce of New York and the, 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 the craziness of Las Vegas and you put them together, and it was essentially you were... Um, if you were to be Corinthicized, it was to be morally um, degraded. And you can look that up in the scriptures. I won't go into a ton of detail right now because it gets pretty graphic. But just understand that there was a ton of corruption and lust and sinfulness in Corinth that regrew with the Roman occupation. So on top of that, um, so that brings up to 44 BC. So Paul on his second missionary journey in 52 AD, um, talks about in Acts 18, uh, I don't know if we have that, but we can put it on the screen. Uh, I'll read it aloud. But I want to give you a little bit of context, because Paul's coming in um, 52 AD to plant the church in Corinth. So we're not even to 1 Corinthians yet, we're just starting with the church here. But it reads in verse 18, then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. 
There he became acquainted with a Jew named Achilla, born in Pontius, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome, so Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince Jews and Greeks alike. So after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook dust from his clothes and said, Your blood's on your own hands. I'm innocent. Then he left and went home to Titus and Justice, a Gentile who worshipped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord, and many came to know Christ in Corinth. Also heard Paul and became believers and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. But when Gallo became governor of Achia, some Jews rose up against Paul and brought him before the governor for judgment. They accused Paul of persuading people to worship God in ways that were contrary to their law. But just as Paul started to make his defense, Gallo turned to Paul's accuser and said, Listen, If this were a case involving some wrongdoer or serious crime, I would have a reason to accept your case. But since it's merely a question of words and names of your law, take care of it yourselves. And he refused to judge him, and he threw them out of the courtroom. The crowd then grabbed Sothensis and the leader of the synagogue and beat him right there. But they paid no attention. I know that has no scripture in it that comes from 1 Corinthians. (laughs) But I want to set the stage of, of what Paul is, is, is walking into with this letter, because in 52 um, AD, when Paul arrives in Corinth, um, there's a few things going on. The, church, the city's about 100 years old, so it's not a young city by any means, but it's also not super old. It's about maybe three generations old, and he's coming in in a time where he would have arrived uh, in Corinth. They had a, a games called the Ithmian Games. It was second only to the Olympics. So if you hear in Scripture Paul talk about athletics or, or training your body to be an athlete or maybe competing for a prize that lasts versus one that fades, this is, um, instruction is given in the context of a city that was hosting one of the biggest games known to the world. A lot of times, like, we're t- listening to the NCAA tournament right now. So... But bigger. Um, but these were games where there was no multiple podiums. It was a winner take all, and each winner got a celery crown, right? Who wants to take home a celery crown? Who thinks that's going to last a long time? But anyway, Paul arrives. These games were held every other year, and, and he arrives in, in 52 AD, right when the games are coming on. Probably he's a tent maker. Um, Corinth at the time wouldn't have had the housing or the hospitality industry to house all these athletes or the huge influx of people that they had for the games. So Paul, uh, uh, Aquila, and Priscilla were all tent makers. They were working, um, providing tents and places for these athletes and the times of the games. And it gave them an amazing opportunity to witness to people about Christ's death on the cross, his resurrection, and that he had come to forgive everyone, right? So, Paul stays there, he talks and works with people, and then the leader of the synagogue, Sotheses, which we'll talk about in 1 Corinthians in a minute, gets beaten right in front of him. Has anyone ever told someone about Christ and then watched their friend just get annihilated right next to him? I haven't either, but I'm assuming it would be a very traumatic experience, right? You're just like, wow, he did nothing, and are you okay? You know, so, so, so it gave Paul a bit of reservation, but then God came to him and said, hey, don't worry, I've got you. Stay here for a year and a half. Build my church. Grow the church into what I know it can be, and watch as I bless this city like never before. So Paul stayed with the church for a year and a half, and in the midst of the, the moral corruption of Corinth and everything that was going on, he was able to coach and guide the church into becoming a body of new believers and then growing in their faith to to receive all the spiritual gifts and everything else. But of course, after a year and a half, Paul left. So now this young church in Corinth is, is by itself growing and working together as a body of believers, but without a spiritual elder or a chief pastor among them. Does anybody know at that time they didn't have a Bible? 
right? I think the first books of the Bible weren't written until about 60, 55 to 60 AD. So if you think about like us gathering together here as a church or as a church collective, imagine Pastor Craig only showing up once every two years. That'd be not crazy. You know, to get, to get that kind of direction and spiritual discipline from your elder, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's what, we're, what Paul is addressing in this letter where he, he comes from a, a, um, a letter of, uh, of, of directness, but it's also out of love saying, hey, I was there with you at this time, but remember what you have been taught. Don't fall back into the earthly things that you came out of, the ungodly places. Stay united, stay holy. This is me coming to you in the form of a letter. So now, knowing all of that, who wants to jump into 1 Corinthians? All right. So let's jump into 1 Corinthians. Um, today, we're only going to cover nine verses. Um, it's pretty much the introduction to 1 Corinthians. It's the introduction that Paul would write in his letter. Oftentimes, um, letters of, at this time, or in this case, the book of the Bible, um, would have been dictated to somebody. So Paul would have been dictating this to be written down, and then this would be delivered to the church and read amongst all the people um, in, a, in a common place or a, a place of, um, of holiness. So you have to think, too, that when this letter is coming to the church in Corinth, it's essentially like everyone's been waiting, waiting, waiting to hear from their leader, and then the last thing you want to do is just take someone to be, you did it wrong. That's not going to build up the church that great. So Paul starts with a greeting, and that's what I want to read today. So it reads, this letter is from Paul chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and from our brother Sothesis. This was the guy that was beaten in the temple while he was there. I am writing to God, God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of the Lord, their Lord and ours. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank God for you, for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ. So there's a, it's only four verses, but there's a lot here. So you've got to remember that the church is young, the young, that the, the society the church is living in is, is very diverse in its moral um, acceptance and upbringing but also that it took pastoral direction from different missionaries, right? So Paul started the church in Acts 18, but then Apollos came and, and, and worked with the church, and even Peter. You know, if you read 1 Corinthians um, 1, even just about six verses from now, Paul talks about some are saying, I'm a follower of Paul, some say, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I only follow Christ. So in his introduction to 1 Corinthians, to the letter, Paul talks about, in verse 2, I'm writing to God's church in Corinth. To you who have been called by God to be his holy people, he made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of the Lord, both their Lord and ours. Paul is calling the church together. So as we get under the hood of the church, these next few weeks, we're going to talk about some of the things the church goes through. And I can tell you right now, some of the things the church goes through is division. Because if we're all sitting here different people, we all have different backgrounds, different experiences, different understandings, different opinions on what's going out in the world, and that can drive us apart. But the unity of Christ and the love of Christ that that uniquely works within the church is the one thing that can bring us back together. So Paul's saying in this introduction is, remember because this is probably a collection at this time of house churches. You know, at this point in, in, in society, the church wasn't built like we, 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 we worship today. There weren't big buildings. People weren't gathering in groups of hundreds to, to worship each week. They were meeting in homes. They were meeting in common places day to day and week to week. So this letter would have been a time where everyone came together, and the letter was written amongst all of the believers in Corinth. No matter whether you're in southern Corinth, northern Corinth, eastern, western, whether you just arrived and you are a fellow believer, not necessarily of the Corinthian church, but you just happen to be there. So Paul is reminding them that Christ died for one and Christ died for all. 
And I think that's something for us as the church we can take home today. Because a lot of times that might change our perspective on how we talk to someone, wouldn't it? If we know Christ came and died for us, but he also came and died for the person across from us, then maybe our tone changes. Maybe our patience changes. Maybe our grace changes. There's so many different things that can drive us apart, but there's one thing that always brings us together. You can think of it similar to um, an engine of a new car. You know, it's, it's essentially you buy a new car off the lot, you expect everything to function as it should. So just as, as, as God creates the church by um, Jesus dying on the cross for forgiveness for our sins, and a, as a body of believers, we come together, the church works. But ideally, you want it to work the best it possibly can. And, and just like a new car with an internal combustion engine might have a break-in period, so does the church, but it's our spiritual growth. We need to grow in our spiritual foundation to function as a living, breathing, effective church in society. But also, just from the start, as I mentioned earlier, you have a testimony. And that brings me to my first point is... Do we recognize a difference in our own lives, and do others see a difference in it as well? And this goes for both being here in the church body, can we see Christ working in other believers, but as we leave this room today and go out through our various jobs, we go to school, we go back home to take care of our kids, do, do people see a difference in us? Or are we the same as everyone else? Do we recognize a difference and do we see a difference in others? And, and this may be a difference that takes time. I know for me, I grew up in this church. Uh, I've been here as long as I can remember. Some of you may remember even longer than I can um, of how long I've been here. But, but I know in my life, even growing up in the church, there came a time when I was coming out of high school into college and getting into the working world and, and, and starting a family where I realized that, that my life is called to be different. That I don't need to react to certain situations the same way I would if I was living in the world. Or maybe I approach a conflict situation differently because I have Christ in my life. There's more grace. Maybe there's an approach from love. Or maybe I don't do X, Y, Z anymore because I am following God. That's no longer an idol or the center of my life. But God is, and this stuff has been washed clean. And then maybe over time, there's things that you have in your life that, anybody with me? It just takes years of God's grace to get them to go away. <laughs> and, and you laugh, but I'm, I'm being true. There, there's certain things, like we may hold on to an addiction. We may say, oh, this isn't that bad. I can live with this. But in the back of our mind, we know this is an addiction. We know it's not healthy. We know we shouldn't be doing it. But it's gotten such a foothold into our life that there's so many barriers we have to break down to allow Christ into that part of our heart to be made new, that it takes time and it takes discipleship and it takes learning and living in the word. The church can be messy. Getting back to a car analogy, sorry, I'm sort of a car guy, but the newer cars come with things called vanity covers. Anybody ever heard of an engine cover? So when you pop the hood and you see this pretty little plastic piece that covers up all of the not-so-pretty stuff. Oftentimes, people may look at the church like that. I know growing up, I did. That from the outside, everything's perfect. That if you're a believer, you have to put forth a perfect life when you walk out of these doors during the week, but that's not true. Remember what Paul talks about is that God came, Christ came for you, so that the church collective could be made whole. We're not called to be perfect, but we are called to serve a perfect God. So sometimes understanding how everyone in the church works together makes the church a living, breathing thing. That the church can go out into the world and be the hands and feet of Christ like we're called to be. But in that hands and feet of Christ, the unique things that sets the church apart is the fact that it's led through love and grace, not discipline and laws. Just as a new Christian, certain things in the church change right away, but other parts take time to come into fruition that the old life that people have come out of needs to wash away for the new life that the church is living into to come to fruition. 
Paul talks about spiritual milk and solid food, and the, the church, luckily, is a makeup of everybody, right? So if you find yourself here today, on to my second point, do you oftentimes find yourself as a learner, but also a teacher? That through your Christian walk as part of the church, you get the chance to absorb things that are preached from leaders on the stage or in Bible studies or just fellow believers that you walk life through together in life groups or friends. But then on the flip side of that, as you absorb so much direction, you get to give it as well. That you get to meet someone where they are and explain to them how they get from point A to point B. That you can encourage someone when they're going through a tough time. That's the beauty of the church. Is it's a give and take. It's a building up of believers to accomplish one thing. I want to continue on 1 Corinthians because we're getting low on time. Uh, verses uh, 5 through 9 in chapter 1. You can follow along. It'll be on the screen behind me. It reads this. Uh, Through him, and this will be God, God has enriched your church in every way. With all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge, this confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. This is Paul talking to the church in Corinth. Now that you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly await for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I think that's a really cool scripture. I'm turning off my timer real quick so it doesn't go nuts here in a second. And it's one I want to look at the last verse on, verse 9, if it's still on the screen. It reads this, God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says. For he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The second song we sang today spoke about God's faithfulness. And that he'll never let us down and that he will see us through the good times and the bad. And I think that's really easy to tell someone else, right? But it's really hard to accept when we need it the most. And I was thinking about this week and praying about it and I think, You know, one of the doubts I always have is I tend to put God in the box with all of my human friends or my human acquaintances, ones that I've relied on to be faithful, but in the back of my mind, I know that that no one's perfect. So I don't hold on too tight to that faithfulness because I know it might fall sometime or someone might not come through. But if we actually get it into our heart that the very nature of God is faithfulness through the generations, I think it changes our perspective of what it means to be a child of God. The scriptures say that that God is a God of angel armies that goes before us and makes a way, and God comes behind us, and I like to think cleans up our mess. It's one of my favorite verses. Because one of the things as a new believer, as a Christian, as part of this church and body of believers that we're called to do, is we're called to go out and engage people. We're called to go out and interact with people and and to form relationships and to make connections. But I know for me, looking back on all the things that I've had in my life and the brokenness and stuff that has been there and, you know, that we're imperfect, the biggest fear is what if I mess something up? How 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 could I... What if I go out and I mess something up and then someone doesn't know God because of me, right? This would have been something the church was dealing with there is, well, we don't have instruction from a spiritual leader. How do we interact with society without getting pulled in? Maybe we'll just pretend we're like everyone else so no one asks questions. But the beauty of it is, no matter what we do, as long as we approach something at the love of Christ and with God at the center, God's going to make it right. God is faithful. Biblical image would be planting a seed. Maybe someone else waters that seed. Maybe someone else nurtures the plant. All of this coming back to spiritual faith. God is faithful. He always has been. He always will be throughout the generations. Don't disqualify yourself this week because of God's lack of faithfulness. He is faithful to you. He is faithful to the church. And he will continue to be. The other part of this, into this verse, is um, 
uh, verse 6, I don't think we take this home enough. It says, this confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now that you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly await for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, he'll keep you strong to the end so that you'll be free, free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. You know, we can get into so many different things with God equipping the church with different spiritual gifts and how he does that and how he builds it up, but I'll, I'm not going to spoil the next seven weeks for you. But one thing I want you to take home today in a preview of what is to come is that God will return, that Christ will return. How many people wake up in the morning before they start their day and remember that as their first thing as they go into the day? I know it took me preparing this message this week to really put that back into my heart. To believe that God is faithful to do what he says, therefore if he's faithful to do what he says, that Christ will return. That means that the church is his hands and feet here on the world, that Paul is reminding the church in Corinth that you have a job to do. That you have a job to do, and this job is not indefinite. This job has an end date. So let's make sure while we're here that we give it our best. That as Paul comes into this city to plant this church in the midst of the games, that he reminds them that there's so many people here right now training for a sport, training for a prize that will fall away. Then why can't we as a body of believers train our faith and train our hearts to show the love of Christ so brightly that other people cannot resist it and want to come see what's going on? That we would give it our all because Christ gave his all on the cross for us. And as a church, we would remember that Christ didn't just give his all on the cross for us, but Christ gave his life on the cross for everyone. And that's the last point, is find our right foundation. You know, second song still got me today. I had no idea what the set list was, but it's, you know, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been so glad. How often do we find our foundation moving with the day, with the week, with the situation that we're reacting to? But if we remember that God is faithful, that we remember that Christ has come and died for us, then We can put away all of the idols that get into our lives. Like the church in Corinth that was being influenced from a lot of outside community. They were interacting in pagan courts. They were eating in pagan temples and and, and doing things of the world. And Paul's reminding them, no, you're different than this. Remember, Christ is your foundation. He's the rock on which you stand. It's not about the sports that are here. That's an opportunity to witness We don't need to devote our lives to the games. We need to use the games as a way to tell people about God. For us, maybe it looks a little different. Maybe it looks like our job that consumes us. Maybe it's our income. We're always chasing money, chasing the next big thing we could buy. And that drives the focus of our life. Maybe it's a relationship you're in that you need to get out of. Maybe it's something you're stuck in. Maybe it's an addiction you've been living with versus confronting it. Maybe it's athletics in school. Maybe it's getting the perfect grades. I don't know. There's there's so many things that can come in and pull Christ out of the center of our day and put him to the side. But maybe one thing we can focus on this week on making that firm foundation true in our hearts. That as we get up in the morning, um, there was a, a gentleman that preached here many years ago named Hopeton Bailey, and I love him for it. He used to say, I get out of bed in the morning, and I say, thank you. Got to set it down nice. Thank you, Jesus. And that's the first thing he does as he gets out of bed. He says, some days I trip over a dog, but it's still, thank you, Jesus, and then you fall out. But it's remembering how we're aligning each day. Just as Paul aligns the church in 1 Corinthians, and I I pray this next seven weeks is a blessing to your life, and I pray it's a blessing to the church, but let's just remember each and every day this week what our foundation is. And then as we set that foundation, as we we step into the world and saying, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me, remember that he's done it for everyone. And remember, you are more than enough to be that person for someone else. And I'll leave you with that today. That's it.
Fairly simple, right? Let's work on it. Let's pray. God, we thank you. God, we come to you as, as, as one church. God, a church that's been a church throughout the generations. A church that's a church here in Charlotte or a church in North Carolina, but we're a church throughout the world. We may be called Christ the King or we may be called many other names. But God, at the end of the day, we're a church of you. So God, we pray your spirit in this church the next few months. God, we pray all the new believers that are here, God, that you would continue to build them up. God, that the spiritual elders in this church would stand up and come to life. And God, that this church would be your living, breathing heart, hands, mouth, and feet as we go out into the world during the week. God, I pray that we'd have some real conversations in the next few weeks. With the goal, God, of out of humility, the church grows. That out of the humility and the grace that comes through reconciliation, God, lives are made new. God, we thank you and we praise you. We ask these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. All right. Can everybody just show Stephen some appreciation for that message? So if something spoke to you today in this message, maybe God's tugging on your heart, knocking on the door, and you, you want some prayer, you want to talk to someone about what you're feeling and, and, and what might be happening, we do invite you. We'll have prayer partners available over on this side of the room. Come join them. Allow them to pray for you. Also, if you'd like to um, partake in the Holy Sacrament of Holy Communion, we will have communion assistance available right here. You can come and partake in communion this morning. But we just want to thank you so much for being here today. Go out, make this week blessed. Stomp those feet when you get up in the morning. Make it an amazing week for Jesus. Bye, everyone.